Welcome to Module 14. This is the module in our course in which we discuss professional ethics. I have two PowerPoint presentations to cover as well as some other documentation. So let's begin. Um, the goal that I have for this session is that you will be able to, in general terms, describe the rules of professional responsibility that apply to attorneys and indirectly apply to paralegals. That you'll be able to find the rules in both print form and online, and that you will be able to uh, locate some primary and secondary authorities that will help you understand what the expectations um, that the legal profession has for both attorneys and paralegals. Um, most ethical issues or legal ethical issues um, are not met of national scope. The American Bar Association is a national organization and it is a voluntary bar association. No one is required to be a member of the American Bar Association. It is a very well regarded group. It does a lot of excellent things, but the majority, I would say the vast majority of attorneys are not members of the American Bar Association. Attorneys, however, have to be members of the Bar Association of the state in which they practice. That is a mandatory bar. So, for example, I'm a member of the Texas Bar Association, but I am not a member of the American Bar Association. That doesn't mean I dislike the American Bar Association. It's a fine organization, but um, I just haven't chosen to pursue membership there. So, we're going to talk about American Bar Association rules, we're going to talk about some national rules, but just keep in mind at the end of the day, the rules that actually directly apply to the attorney with whom you work are going to be the Texas Bar Rules. So most of our time we're going to be spending talking about that. Now the Texas Bar Rules don't exist in a vacuum. They are a reflection of, upon the fact that Texas has a similar concerns and interests that exist generally amongst attorneys kind of anywhere, but certainly in the United States. Here is a link to the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. This is a name that you need to know. Um, obviously, you can see from the name that this is about Texas. These are the rules that apply to professional, meaning attorneys in this context. Um, and they have to do with discipline. If you violate the rules, you can be sanctioned. And we'll talk about the sanctions that can occur to an attorney. And so this is the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. This is, I'll tell you when there are things that I'm going to really want you to be familiar with, and this is one of those expectations, that you know this term. Um, attorneys are the people who are ultimately responsible for following these rules. Um, the reason that I really, really want to follow the Texas Bar Association rules is, I mean, I think they're good, but at the end of the day, if I don't follow them, I can be disbarred. I can lose my ability to practice law in the state. Well, paralegals don't sit for the bar exam, and they can't be members of the Texas Bar Association. So the Texas Bar Association, which is, after all, just a private club, can't um, penalize paralegals in any way directly. But the, Ameri uh, the Texas Bar Association can penalize the attorneys with whom the paralegal works. So if a paralegal violates one of the rules that the Texas Bar Association has established, and the attorney with whom he or she works did not stop the conduct, then the attorney, who is ultimately responsible for everything the paralegal does, can be sanctioned. In fact, can be disbarred. So you can see if what you do could result in your attorney losing his position or her position, that's a pretty strong incentive for you to fly straight. Um, because obviously if he's out of a job, probably you're out of a job. So um, it's an indirect system of motivation. And that's one of the reasons some of uh, paralegals may think to themselves, why is the attorney always being the one that's the final judge? Why can't I ever make the final decision? Um, and it really comes back to the idea that the attorney has the ultimate responsibility to get this right. He or she has made oaths and has received training so that he or she can do this effectively. Um, sometimes what happens when a paralegal has been practicing for a long time, and I have seen this in my practice, that you'll find a very experienced paralegal who's been practicing in a particular area for a long time, maybe for 20 or more years. He or she knows this area like the back of his or her hand and has a lot of expertise, both legal knowledge as well as practical knowledge. Um, then a new attorney, maybe straight out of law school, is assigned uh, to the matter, and now this new attorney, who may be young enough to be the paralegal son or daughter, is telling the paralegal, well, this is how we're going to do things, and maybe it's a different approach, and the paralegal may be thinking to himself or herself, well, that's not a good idea, that's not going to work, that's not what is done in this particular area. 
And the paralegal very likely is correct. Um, but ultimately, it's the paralegal's job to inform the attorney, say, hey, this is how we've been doing things. These are the reasons why we do things. Here are some examples of how we've been doing things. Um, all of that type of information. But at the end of the day, if the attorney says, nope, we're doing something differently, then uh, the paralegal ought to adopt to, to that particular plan. But of course, if the paralegal thinks that there's something unethical, or criminal about the behavior, then the paralegal uh, shouldn't participate in it. If it's a large, large enough firm where there are other attorneys in the group, um, it may be appropriate in extreme cases for the paralegal to alert a more senior attorney if something really doesn't seem to be right. But at the end of the day, the attorney is the one who has ultimately signed the documents, who is ultimately responsible. Unless, of course, we're talking about criminal misconduct, and hopefully that won't ever be something that you have to worry about in your professional career. This is the a, a link to the ABA website. Um, this is really just a page that shows you what you can purchase from the American Bar Association in terms of professional uh, responsibility books. Professional responsibility, by the way, you can see the terminology right here. So let me turn on my little pen here. So here we have professional responsibility. That's the term that we use for legal ethics. So when you see professional responsibility, it means legal ethics. There are sy sy synonyms for each other. Um, anyway, this is information about the model rules of professional conduct. Let me pause for a second and talk a little bit about model rules. Model rules um, are rules that are developed not by legislators or even bar associations. They're usually developed by the American Bar Association or sometimes by um, uh, law professors. And what a model rule is or a model code is, is uh, it's a group of, of people that have gotten together, usually very smart, usually very committed to the cause, who do a lot of research. So I'm sure when these model rules were developed, the American Bar Association representatives looked at um, all the different states. They probably looked at what Canadian bar associations did, what British, what Japanese, what Russian, what you know, different kinds of countries all over the world, what their practices were in this area. And what they tried to do was develop the best practices. They looked at, you know, hundreds of choices and said, we think these one or two or three are the best choices. And then they picked the one that they thought was ultimately the best choice, and then they developed these rules. Then they began to market these rules to the various bar associations. And so they would go, they would knock on the door of the Oklahoma Bar Association and say, hey, we're the American Bar Association, and we have some suggested rules of professional conduct that your bar association might want to adopt. Well, of course, the Oklahoma Bar Association is under no requirement to adopt the ABA's bar, uh, ABA model rules, but, you know, pretty much all state bar associations have a lot of respect for the ABA, so they're going to uh, pay it some attention, they're going to be open to listening to what they have to say. And they might, the Oklahoma Bar Association or the Montana Bar Association or the Massachusetts Bar Association or any of the others would be free to say, thanks but no thanks, we, we like our rules as they are, or um, yes, we love your, your proposal, we're going to adopt it exactly the way that you wrote it. Or perhaps the most likely result would be result number three, which is we like some parts of it, but some parts of it we don't like. So we're going to take some and leave some. So the, the actual rules that are adopted in any given state may be based upon the model rules of professional conduct, but they might ultimately not be an exact duplication of that. And let's go back here. So you see we have the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. And you can see... The ABA also has model rules of professional conduct. So you can see the similarities in names, but the names aren't exactly the same. And the Texas rules are not, uh, they were not adopted completely from the ABA. There are some adaptations that um, are relevant. If you have questions about this topic, um, uh, you are, uh, you, you absolutely should ask them. <laughs> um, right now I'm going to go to another item that we're going to load here. And um, if you have questions, be sure to email them to me, and we will um, cover those questions. It's going to take just a second for this to load. Um, so email them to me if you have a question, and I think it's a question of general interest, then I will um, post it on uh, the website. If I think it is a question that might just be of interest to to you, then I might just answer that question as a one-off to you. If you have a bigger question or a question that involves a more elaborate conversation, please come to my office hours, and I'm happy to talk about this in a lot more detail. I'm not going to dive 
tremendously deeply into this topic. When I teach Introduction to the Law and Legal Professions, which is LGLA 1307, I spend more time on these issues. So if you've taken that course with me, you're going to find that a lot of the things that I'm going to say in the next few minutes are going to be very familiar to you. If you haven't taken LGLA 1307 yet, um, you may or may not have this, you know, it depends on whether you have it with me or somebody else, but you're likely to get a more a robust introduction to these topics. Um, if you've already taken the course, this should be a, a helpful review whether you had the initial course with me or not. So um, this is a more kind of in-depth view of this topic. And of course, it's a really important topic. So I don't, um, if you, if you um, uh, don't necessarily, if you leave this course and you don't know how to form out, form a certificate of formation or you don't know how to uh, write a business letter, that's unfortunate. But if you leave here without having some understanding of the ethical requirements that paralegals have, um, that could be such a serious matter that, worst case scenario, you could end up in prison if you make some missteps in this area. Don't think that's likely, but um, obviously that's a little bit more serious than um, uh, forgetting to put a, a, a colon after the dear Mr. Green salutation in a business letter. We're talking about a little bit higher stakes when we're talking about professional ethics. So let's get started. This is a, the second PowerPoint I'm going to cover, and this talks about ethics and professional responsibility. So let's go into it. Some of this I've already said, so I'm going to cover a lot of these slides really quickly. We have um, a total of 61 slides. Oh, well, actually, uh, we've already covered nine, though. So this was just the, the first ones we did were just added to the ones that we already had. So we're already on slide nine, so good for us. Um, as, as I hinted at before, but let me say a little clearly, more clearly, paralegals have to follow their state's ethical rules. So since we're in Texas, and presumably your job as a paralegal is going to be in Texas, you have to follow the Texas Bar Association rules. As I said, you won't be disbarred if you don't because you're not a member of the Bar Association, but the license of the attorney with whom you work is at Jeopardy. And certainly if you start doing things that put his or her bar membership in question, your employment is not going to be long and your reputation in the community as a paralegal isn't going to be very good. For the most part, the um, type of regulation that paralegals receive is not direct regulation. The state itself, be it Texas or Florida or Wyoming, isn't going to uh, really uh, uh, regulate what a paralegal does. Uh, a paralegal is not like an attorney in the sense that a paralegal must have some kind of license in order to practice as a paralegal. Um, anyone can be a paralegal. There is no particular a degree or test or fee that has to be paid. There's no particular test that has to be passed. Now, uh, most uh, law firms and most corporations are going to look for something like a associate's degree or a certificate or a bachelor's degree before they hire somebody. But historically, I'll tell you, when I started practicing in 1990, um, most paralegals, this is really before kind of the, the community colleges got into a paralegal programs to the extent that they are now. At that time, most of the paralegals were not, had, did not have any particular legal training. Many of them were former legal secretaries who had learned the ins and outs of the legal profession by typing documents and seeing documents. Um, and they were um, a smart, uh, mainly women, who uh, also showed initiative and said, hey, boss, can I try one of these? I've typed up 10 of these. I'd like to try doing one myself and save you some time. And they proved themselves time and again to be good at, at, at those additional tasks, and so they became a paralegal. Another category were former journalists, people that were good at writing and, and uh, research, although they did, oftentimes didn't have any particular legal expertise. But they were looking perhaps for a change in their career, and this seemed like a reasonable place to end up. A third category were former school teachers. Again, usually good writers, oftentimes good researchers, although they rarely had specific legal experience. But they were able to um, uh, use leverage those skills that they had that were non-legal into a legal position. And the fourth category of paralegals that I commonly dealt with in, in uh, the early 1990s was uh, students who had recently graduated from a four-year university who were taking a year or two off before they attended law school. Usually these students were academically very strong, and they wanted to take a couple of years off for several reasons. 
sometimes they wanted to make sure that they really wanted to go to law school. And what better way to find out than to be a paralegal in the law firm to see exactly what attorneys did before they invested the time and the money to get that law degree. Another reason where these students would, uh, or these former students would, would want to become a paralegal is that they wanted to earn some money. They had accumulated some college debt and they knew they were about to accumulate a lot more. Uh, law school debt, and so they wanted to manage that debt a little bit by taking a bit of time off so they could uh, uh, get their asset situation in line. A third reason was that some paralegals thought that this would help them get into the law school that they wanted or help them know kind of what particular courses they ought to take. Um, so those were some factors that affected who became paralegals. I didn't know any paralegals in that time period that had a paralegal certificate or who had an AAS in paralegal studies or who even had a bachelor's degree in paralegal studies. It just didn't exist as far as I know, or at least it was uncommon. But nowadays, that is the usual path. Even though it's the usual path, though, it doesn't mean that you have to follow it. It doesn't mean that um, the, the district attorney in Collin County is going to arrest you if you don't happen to have these credentials. Not at all. There is no rule that you have. Before you can claim yourself a paralegal, you have to have a particular credential. In fact, the only state that has rules that say, hey, you can't do this as a paralegal, or, or you can do this as a paralegal, but you have to have these credentials, is the state of California. In all the other states, what they say is, we're going to treat a paralegal just like any other non-attorney. They can work with an attorney, but ultimately the attorney is going to be responsible. Only in California is there's this category of people who are paralegals and who, who can do certain limited tasks independently of attorneys. And again, that's only in California. I don't know if it's a way to the future or not. I haven't seen a lot of activity in that area. I haven't seen it be expanded in California and it hasn't spread to other states. But who knows what the future holds? And actually, I think people in the paralegal and legal community have uh, mixed feelings about it. Some people think that it's a good idea that paralegals can work independently of attorneys and are subject to some regulation independent of their association with attorney, and some people don't think it's the best idea. So let's talk about the way that paralegals are actually regulated. And as I said, we've already talked about the word indirectly. They're indirectly regulated. Well, first of all, they have to follow the rules of ethical rules of attorney conduct, what the Bar Association says attorneys have to do, because after all, if they mess up, the attorney is going to be in trouble. They also have to follow the state rules regarding UPL. UPL is a term that you'll hear in the legal community, and what it stands for is the unauthorized practice of law. Imagine for a second that I uh, decided, you know what, my doctor, he earns a lot of money, and he's not that good, so I'm just going to call myself a doctor, hang out my shingle, and I'm probably going to be every bit as good at treating people as he is. He seems like he's only prescribing me aspirin and Tylenol anyway, and I can do that. I can tell people to take those medications. So I um, rented office space, put on a lab jacket, uh, called myself Dr. Birgert, and lo and behold, some people actually come to see me. Um, and um, these people send me for medical advice, and I give them medical advice, and I examine them, and I say, well, yes, I think you, you need to have this done, or you don't need any further help, or whatever. Anyway, eventually it comes to the attention of the Medical Association in Texas that uh, Cynthia Groover, who isn't a doctor, is holding herself out to be a doctor. Um, and the Medical Association, when they find this out, contacts probably the district attorney for Collin County, which is where my practice is, and say, hey, you need, you need to do something about this lady. She is putting patients at risk. She's telling them that she's a doctor, but she has no particular training. And so, you know, someone might come in with a serious illness, perhaps a heart attack or perhaps some type of cancer, but she doesn't know to tell them, hey, you have to go to the hospital to go to the emergency room, or you need to see an oncologist to address that cancer. And so they might die because they went to somebody who wasn't a doctor. And you can imagine that the district attorney for Collin County would also be appalled and concerned. Because someone pretending to be a doctor puts everyone else at risk. Because the reality is, when you and I go to see a doctor, we trust that person. We know they know stuff we don't know. And so when they tell us, everything's fine, you're perfectly fine, you don't have to worry, most of us say, okay, I don't have to worry. If they say, oh, this is serious, you need immediate attention, most of us say, oh, okay, I will do what you say. We don't really have a basis to evaluate whether they are, taught, are, are giving us good advice or, or bad advice. We just trust them. Similarly with most people when they see an attorney. If somebody, if you go visit an attorney for legal advice and they say, oh, no, you don't have to do anything, you're probably going to believe them because, after all, they have the law degree. They have the bar admission. Uh, but they may be giving you bad advice, especially if they're not really an attorney. 
And so that's why we have laws that say if you engage in the unauthorized practice of law, if you try to practice law when you're not a licensed attorney, you can be thrown in prison. It's a serious crime. It can even be a felony. We'll talk more about that as we go forward. Then there are guidelines that the ABA has put forward and that various paralegal associations have put forward, including NALA. In this course, we haven't talked a lot about NALA, but NALA is the National Association of Legal Assistants. It is probably the most well-known of the paralegal associations, and it is the one that um, has probably the, the test that is most well-known and perhaps best regarded of the uh, paralegal cert certification test. There are lots of others. It's not the only one that is, that is good by any means, but I wanted to uh, let you be aware of what NALA is, and we'll go through some of the guidance that NALA gives to paralegals. It's been a significant amount of time on that as we go forward in this lecture. Okay, well, let's talk, we've talked briefly about how paralegals are regulated. Let's talk about attorneys. How are attorneys regulated? Well, the legal profession is a profession. And a profession is kind of a tricky thing. Let me draw a little picture here. I'm going to change the color from yellow to a little bit darker color so it'll show up better. Imagine that I have a circle here. And I have a few dots. These represent the attorneys. Obviously, there's lots of attorneys in Texas, but these represent, maybe each attorney here represents, you know, 1,000 people or something. Well, there's all of these people out here that would love to be attorneys. They're out of work, maybe, or maybe they have a job, but they think, in some cases, rightly so, that attorneys earn lots of money. And so they think, well, oh, I can go to that, but I can't get in because, Maybe I don't have a bachelor's degree, or maybe no law school except me because my GPA is too weak. Or um, they have a good GPA, they have a bachelor's, but they can't afford law school. Law school's phenomenally expensive. Or perhaps they have some little prominent background, uh, some relatively minor criminal situation arose. Um, nothing terrible, they didn't murder anybody, but it's sufficiently severe that the Bar Association says, no, we're not going to let you become a member of our club. Even though they're, they've turned over a new leaf and they're a good person, they want in. But lots and lots of people are kept out of the legal profession, either because of education, because of um, lack of success on the bar exam, or because of some kind of situation or background that makes them um, not eligible to be a member of the Bar Association. And so these are um, barriers. And, you know, one can sympathize with the people out, out here. Many of them, I'm sure, would make excellent attorneys, but circumstances have conspired to exclude them. And if you think about the people inside, well, the people inside passed all those hurdles. So they have some motivation systems here in play, too. For one thing, they're thinking, why should we make it easier for the people on the outside to become a member of our club if we had to do all those things, if we had to go to college, if we had to have good grades so we'd get into law school, if we had to pay for law school, if we had to pass that background test, if we had to pass the bar exam, um, if we had to do all those things, everybody else should. They shouldn't get an easier um, ride than we got. So that's one kind of philosophy that some attorneys have. It's not the nicest philosophy, but, you know, there's a certain logic to it. Another thing, which is even less nice, is attorneys say, well, gee whiz, if there were a lot more attorneys, there, there would be a lot more com uh, competition for clients. If there was more competition for clients, I might not be able to charge as much for my services. Imagine that you have um, an, uh, an attorney in a small town. There's only two other attorneys. There's a total of three attorneys in the town, and each one of them has about a third of the legal business. But suddenly, there were three more attorneys who were licensed to practice. Well, you've got to divide that, that pie up in, in even smaller pieces. Um, and so the, each one of the attorneys that was there before is probably going to get less business, and because there's more competition, is probably going to be, be able to charge um, a lower, we'll probably have to charge a lower rate to get the business, even the, the lesser business that it's going to get. But you can see how, it may not sound very fair, but you can see how the attorneys inside here are going to say, gee, this doesn't sound like a good deal for me. That sounds like it's going to cost me a lot of money to let in all these people on the outside. This is what sort of people call an oligarchy or kind of like a monopoly we're in. There's a lot more demand than there is supply, and the supply is being tightly controlled. And that's true. And just like we want that for doctors and we want that for attorneys, we don't want that for attorneys. Because let's face it, if anybody could call themselves an attorney, 
how could the average person, how could your grandmother decide which attorney to go to? Because some attorneys would be highly skilled and would be able to give your grandmother excellent advice, but a lot of other people who call themselves attorneys might not know any more about the law than she does. They may have watched, you know, a few Law and Order episodes, but they may have no idea how to actually do things. But they, they talk a good game, and grandma gives them money, but nothing gets done. So you can see how you need to have a system so that the unsophisticated, the people who don't know a lot about law, can feel confident that they're getting good advice. So when you have a profession, you have barriers to entry, and the barriers to entry oftentimes are education, tests, and ethics that you have past the background check. But there's a recognition that when you have barriers to entry, you need to have a counterbalance because barriers to entry mean that there's going to be more demand than there is supply. And so you want to have ethical rules. And some examples of those ethical rules are attorneys are supposed to do pro bono work. They're supposed to help people in the community who can't afford legal services. Also, attorneys are supposed to ethically advise uh, clients. Um, for example, if an attorney really doesn't practice in that area, um, the attorney should uh, suggest other attorneys in the area who could help the client uh, uh, have, a, have more success in that particular matter. So that is what a profession is. Um, even though some paralegals are called a profession, paralegalism really isn't a profession. It's what's called a paraprofession. Right that up here. And when I say that it's not a profession, I don't mean, of course, that it's not professional. I don't mean that people who are paralegals aren't very professional people. It's hard to write on the surface. Um, many times when we use the, profet the term profession in everyday conversation, what we mean is, is that it's a good job. It's a responsible job. It's a uh, job that has gen genuine um, importance to the community. And so you might refer to somebody as um, a, a business owner, for example. He's a professional person. Um, you might even refer to an athlete as a professional athlete, meaning he's paid for doing um, his profession. There's just one F in profession. Probably there's just one F, I'm sorry. I should put in more, more than one F in there. Um, there we go. Um, but really the term profession doesn't mean that. It means that there are barriers to entry. It means certain people are excluded and people who do get included have to follow particular rules. And if they don't follow the rules, they can be picked out. Traditional professions are teaching engineering, accounting, ministry, law, um, and medicine. There's some others, but those are the main ones. Um, para, uh, paralegals aren't because, again, there is no barrier to entry. No one is saying, you can't call yourself a paralegal. Um, and, so, and there are no ethical requirements that bind a paralegal except indirectly through his or her association with an attorney. So a paraprofession is probably the better term for a paralegal. It doesn't mean that paralegal work is not very important. It doesn't mean that uh, paralegals cannot act extremely professionally, dress professionally, uh, communicate important legal ideas and all that good stuff. It's not intended to be questioning the importance of the job or its worth, but it's just referring to um, the definition of the term and how paralegalism doesn't fit with the definition of profession. So let's look at how attorneys who are in this profession, who have these barriers to entry, are uh, regulated. Well, the first is through a bar association. They have to be a member of their state bar association. The state Supreme Court usually has a lot of control over the bar association, and of course they can also make rules independently uh, about certain matters, and we'll talk about that. State legislatures, who are usually made up of largely of attorneys, um, and then the U.S. Supreme Court, you may say, what is the U.S. Supreme Court doing talking about attorneys um, regulation? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court main area where it regulates is that once upon a time, many, many years ago, back in the 1970s, when I was a kid, guess what? At 2 o'clock in the morning, if you turned on your TV, you would not see Mike the Hammer asking you questions such as, were you in a car accident? You may have a legal claim. There was nothing remotely like that. On telephone books, you wouldn't see advertisements saying, you know, do you need workers' compensation help? You should sue the guy who ran into you, or whatever the thing is. Those did not, those were not um, out there. They just did not occur. And the reason they didn't occur is because bar associations prohibited attorneys from virtually every kind of advertising. 
And the only very slight advertisement that was permitted was very staged, very conservative, very professional. Not like the more flashy, um, somewhat garish things that we see today. But a few attorneys challenged these rules and said, hey, this violates my freedom of speech. Um, I ought to be able to uh, talk to my potential clients and tell them why they ought to use my services, or even to just inform them they might have a claim. They may be completely unaware of that. And the U.S. Supreme Court agreed. They said, yes, well, it can be regulated what uh, attorneys can advertise and how they advertise. Generally speaking, attorneys have the right to advertise, and there can't be restrictions that make it impossible to uh, provide information for, to their potential clients. So that was really a game changer, and that's why the U.S. Supreme Court is on this list as um, one of the regulators as attorneys. And you can see here when we say attorneys are primarily self-regulated, I don't mean that each attorney regulates himself or herself. Obviously, we all regulate ourselves. You know, we uh, make decisions about uh, whether we're going to take this action or not. When I say self-regulated, I mean attorneys are regulating other attorneys. Let's look at the licensing requirements. There is variation by state. Um, the vast, vast majority of states, though, follow this equation. Um, and once we go through this, I'll tell you about some variations in the standard. The first thing is you need a bachelor's degree. It can really be in anything. It can be a BA. It can be a BS. It can be an engineering degree of some type. It can be a, a BBA, business uh, degree, really any um, a bachelor's degree is permitted. There are no courses you have to take in undergraduate school so that you'll be qualified to go to law school. The next thing is you have to get a law degree from an ABA accredited law school. And that's the rule in Texas and that's the rule in the vast, vast majority of states. The ABA has very high standards for law schools. Um, some people think that they are necessary standards to protect that high level of competency amongst the attorneys who are practicing. Some people think that the ABA uh, standards um, have resulted in law school being too expensive for many people to uh, participate in, and that has reduced the number of people joining uh, or becoming attorneys, and so that means that there's less supply out there to meet the demand, and that has caused attorney's fees to be higher than they otherwise would be. Others say even the, the people who go to law school, to an ABA credit law school, because the ABA requirements make law school so much more expensive, even those people when they graduate, they may have gone into law school thinking, oh, I'm going to help the community, I'm going to provide low-cost services, but then they have all of this debt. And so they really don't even have the choice during their first 10 years or so of actually um, working for a modest paycheck because they have so much debt to pay off. So uh, for those reasons, some people say that the ABA standards are perhaps too demanding. And as a result, there are a few states that do not require ABA accreditation for its law schools. This isn't true for Texas, and it's certainly true for the majority of states that you have to have it. But I think Alabama doesn't require, um, at least one of its schools is that it allows students to sit for the Alabama bar, isn't ABA accredited. I think California also allows certain law schools that are not ABA accredited to um, for those students to sit for the bar. But in Texas and in the vast majority of states, this law school has to be ABA accredited before you can sit for the uh, bar in the state of Texas, before you can become admitted to the bar association. Um, one of the things currently about law degrees is it takes three years. I mean, it's not the summers, but it's, it's three pretty full years, and it's pretty hard to uh, work in a meaningful way while you're going to law school, certainly not in a full-time job. Some programs like SMU has, have a four-year law degree in which it is possible, I suppose, to work a pretty significant job where you go into law school, but it's a very, very challenging situation to be in. wouldn't recommend that if you can avoid having that, that level of stress. So the law school is typically going to take three years. So you, you got your bachelor's degree, you've gone to law school for three years, and you've uh, got, gotten that JD, that's what you get from a law school these days. Juris Doctorate is what that's called. And he's not cooperating here. Um, then you have to, and many times people get their bar, their, their background check um, earlier in the process, um, but sometimes usually in your third year of law school, you will apply to your bar to get the background check started. And they go back 
very, very far. I can remember I graduated from law school when I was 25, and I had to, to get records back from when I was um, in my first years in elementary school. We moved around a lot, so I was having to hunt down various addresses, various school names, you know, as if something I did in kindergarten would have any relevancy to um, whether I ought to be a member of the bar at age 25. It's kind of silly. I suppose it might make more sense if I were applying for bar membership at 55 than at 25. But anyway, the, the rules were, were such that you had to get fingerprinted, or you was going to be a criminal background check, um, and then if personal interviews would happen. Uh, so it was a pretty involved process. And it, of course, wasn't cheap. And of course, the student has to finance it. And um, students can be denied. I've known people who have applied for um, bar membership who have been turned down because of something in their background um, that didn't seem terribly serious, but the bar association thought was significant enough that it precluded them from being members of the bar. Then the last thing is you have to pass the bar exam. And in Texas, there are two parts of the bar, and this is true for most states. One is called the MPRE, um, the Model Professional Responsibility Exam. And this is a really short test. I think it's about two hours, and you can actually take it before you're done with law school. That's a relatively easy test to pass. It is based upon the model rules of professional responsibility. Um, and it's something that you learn about when you're in law school. It's very, very similar to the material that we're covering here today. Um, then, the, then in Texas, we have another part of the, the bar, which actually has three parts. The first part is called the multi-state, and it is a multiple choice test. I think it had 200 questions. I might be mistaken. Of course, my information is a little dated, but anyway, it's a very involved test, and this is offered in most states. I don't think it's offered in Louisiana because they have they don't have a common law tradition, and there may be a few other states that don't use the multi-state, but most states use the multi-state, and it's used for the common law. Uh, it is true that there are some variations in the common law between states, but there's really more similarities than differences, and so you're able to have a common law test that is going to cover most of the, the points of commonality between the different states. Then the second day of the test was a Texas-only part of the exam. It was an essay part, and so you had to answer Texas-specific questions, um, essay questions. And the final part was a half-day test, and that was um, kind of a fill in the blank or short answer uh, test. And so if you, so all of your, your, your grades for those or your scores for those three days were compiled and um, if the score was high enough, then you were now a member of the Bar Association and you could be sworn in to be an attorney in Texas. That's the process. It's pretty similar across the other states. Again, the, the, uh, the state specific test might only be two days instead of three days, for example. Um, uh, that's one difference. Uh, another difference is I think California allows online law schools. The ABA prohibits online law schools. I don't even know if they permit any online law school courses. They certainly don't permit uh, law school, uh, a whole, uh, the entire law school program to be online. Um, who knows what the, the future holds in this area? Uh, President Barack Obama has opined that law school ought to be dropped for two to two years. He was a former law professor at the University of Chicago before he went into politics, so he has some experience and some knowledge in that area in addition to being an attorney. Okay, so let's look at the professional codes and rules. Um, the model rules of professional conduct was created by the ABA. In 1983, they previously had a different version of it. And this is the basis of rules in most states. Not all states, I think about two-thirds to three-quarters are using the model rules of professional conduct. And this is the text. Texas has modeled its rules upon the model rules of professional conduct. And we call that name Texas Rules of Disciplinary Conduct. And you can see we talked about this in the previous um, PowerPoint. This is the name you, you are responsible for knowing this. So what can the Bar Association do? Let's say I'm an attorney, my admitted to practice in Texas, and I violate one of these rules in the disciplinary rules of professional conduct. What can happen to me? Well, there are really five things that can happen to me. Three that the Texas Bar Association can do to me. They can reprimand me. And there's two types of reprimands that can happen. One is a public and one is a private. Private reprimand doesn't sound too bad, right? I'm uh, called on the rug and told you did something naughty. But it's private. Um, I don't have to tell anyone, and it's not going to be published anywhere. And so um, I know that I've gotten in trouble, but kind of no one else does. 
usually the private reprimand is designed to put someone on notice. So if you ever do that again type thing, you will get a public reprimand or something more serious. A public reprimand is a more serious matter. If you get a public reprimand, then that means that um, you are uh, uh, it, you, your, your reprimand is going to be available for the general public to see, and it is also means that it's going to be published in the Texas Bar Journal, and so all of your colleagues are going to see that you have been publicly reprimanded. Obviously, it's intensely embarrassing, and it is very, very damaging to one's um, uh, career as an attorney, naturally. The next thing is that you can be suspended. This is more serious than a reprimand. It means that there is a period of time in which you are ineligible to um, practice law. Your license is suspended. It might be for a day. It might be for a month. It might be for two years. During that time, you cannot provide services as an attorney to a uh, client. So all of your clients that you have, you have to notify and say, I can't represent you anymore. And even if you are able to start representing them shortly in the future, how many of those are the clients are going to return. I mean, after they find out you were reprimanded by the Bar Association and your license was suspended, they're probably not going to be too excited about coming back until you have to completely rebuild your practice. And if any of the potential clients know about your suspension, they're not going to be too interested in knowing about you. And all this information about every single um, attorney is available on the um, uh, Texas Bar website. So it's publicly available. The last um, thing that this bar association does is can disbar you. They can remove you from the bar. That's a permanent sanction. Um, this uh, is obviously the most severe penalty. All of these, though, are civil penalties. The Texas Bar Association or any other bar association does not have the power to throw you in prison. Um, all they can do is kick you out of the club or suspend your membership in the club. But when you violate a, a serious enough sanction, even more severe things can happen to you. One is that you can be civilly sued for negligence, which is usually in this conduct context is really malpractice. So let's say that you failed to um, properly handle a matter that your client had given to you to handle, and as a result, the client lost significant sum of money, and he decides to sue you about that. Well, and if the lawsuit is successful, you can be on the hook for quite a bit of money. Um, so that's a civil liability, and also obviously very damaging to your career. But it can be even worse than that. You can have criminal liability if you break a law. Um, one example would be if you embezzle your client's money, or um, if you um, perjure yourself, or encourage a your client to perjure himself. Those would be instances where you could have criminal liability. Another way you can have criminal liability is engaging in the, in the unauthorized practice of law. Now you may be thinking, well, how can an attorney engage in an authorized practice of law? I mean, if he's an attorney, he's authorized to practice law, so how can he be guilty of the unauthorized practice of law? Well, there's two ways. The first is he can help somebody else who is not an attorney engage in the unauthorized practice of law, kind of like an abettor or an accomplice to the event. Um, and that could be a paralegal if he doesn't monitor what his paralegal or her paralegal is doing, um, and the paralegal starts crossing the line and giving legal advice, then the attorney might be guilty of facilitating the unauthorized practice of law. But the, another way that an attorney can be guilty of unauthorized practice of law is if he or she um, uh, practices law in a state in which he or she is not a member of the Bar Association. For example, I'm admitted to practice in the state of Texas and a few federal courts, but I am not admitted to practice in any other state. So in 49 of the 50 states, if I were to practice law, I would be guilty of the unauthorized practice of law. It's not that those other states don't want me to be a member of their bar, but until I actually join it, until I do all of the things that they require, let me go back to the list, until I prove to them that I have that bachelor's degree and that law degree, until I pass that background test that their background check that they're going to require, and until I pass their bar exam or I'm waived in, as the term is oftentimes used for a long-term attorney, you can get credit for uh, practice experience five years. You've been practicing for five years. Usually you can join the bar without sitting for the whole test again. But if I don't do all that stuff, if I don't pay the fees, which are not trivial at all, um, and I, I try to give legal advice in that jurisdiction, I am guilty that I don't have to practice the law. So for the purposes of the law, you're only in, you can only give legal advice in that state in which you're a member. So that's the final thing, the criminal liability.
Now, as a paralegal, these first three can't happen to me. I can't be reprimanded, suspended, or disbarred by the state bar. My attorney can be because of my actions. But the last two, yes, can happen to me as a paralegal. I can be held civilly liable for negligence slash malpractice if I gave poor legal assistance to a client. And again, I can be guilty of criminal liability such as embezzlement or suborning perjury or the unauthorized practice of law. So I definitely do have some exposure both as an attorney and as a paralegal. I don't want to scare you. I, mean, I don't want to make it sound like attorneys are going to prison right and left on these issues and are paralegals, but it is something to be aware of. Okay, so let's think about the topic of paralegal ethical codes. There are two that are out there. I'm going to show you this one in just a second, the NFPA, which is a very respectable, respected uh, paralegal organization, but we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about their code of ethics. We're going to spend more time on knowledge. Um, it was first issued in 1975, but it's revised uh, several times since then, um, neither one of these codes nor any of the others is legally mandated. A paralegal doesn't have to follow any of these rules. Of course, if I, ch as a paralegal, choose to join NALA and I don't play by their rules, then NALA can kick me out the same way that an attorney who joins the state bar can be kicked out of the bar because his membership can be uh, rejected at any time. But um, uh, I don't have to do these things, but as a paralegal, it certainly makes sense for my career to do these things. Here are, here are the model, the NFPA model display rules and ethical considerations. I'm just letting you see this as a FYI. We're not going to spend any time on that. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the standards that many states or that um, many governing bodies have looked at for how to use paralegals. First thing to note is that pretty uniformly courts and bar associations value the contribution that paralegals can make. And they encourage their attorneys to use paralegals to the extent that is ethically appropriate. Some of the reasons that they recommend this is that paralegals, because they don't have all that debt from law school, um, can, um, uh, that they, that it is possible for them to accept jobs at a lower pay rate and it is possible then for the, the law firm, because they're charging, you're having to pay less for the, for the wages of the paralegal, to then bill out the paralegal's time at a lower hourly rate. And so as a result of this, the, um, there is a larger portion of the public who can now afford legal services because the paralegals are doing portions of the work. And this expands a legal access, so that's a good thing for our society. ANALA has some standards and guidelines for the use of paralegals, as does the ABA, and there are state guidelines, too. Texas has guidelines very much in line with what these others say. When I started practicing in 1990, I think I've already shared with you that there wasn't really the built-in uh, uh, legal community or educational community that was um, providing training for paralegals in the legal area. And most paralegals learn via on-the-job experience. Um, and I guess in part because of this lack of formal legal training, paralegals, while many were respected and many, many were excellent, excellent paralegals, uh, probably they were not held, I'm sure they were not held as in the high esteem as they are nowadays. Um, paralegals were oftentimes kind of just a step above the status that a legal secretary would have. Nowadays, a paralegal is treated um, not the same status as an attorney, but uh, definitely a, a step, significant step between an attorney and a, a legal secretary. And the type of work, therefore, that paralegals routinely do nowadays is very different from the work that paralegals were doing back in 1990 when I graduated law school. In fact, paralegals can do almost all legal tasks that junior attorneys do. I like to use this example. My first two years of practice as an attorney, I worked for a large law firm in Houston. And during those 104 weeks, there was probably no more than uh, two weeks, maybe not even two weeks, of work that I did that was attorney-only work. If you were to add up, they weren't two weeks in, in one period of time, but if you were to add up all the hours, maybe they would add up to two weeks or maybe about Roughly 2% uh, of my time was I doing attorney-only work. The vast, vast majority of things that I did, a paralegal today, could do. Now, in 1990, I don't think most attorneys would have seen that a paralegal would be able to ethically do as much as we now think of them being able to do. 
But even today, if you go to work for, let's say you go to law school and you go to work for a large law firm, the first couple of years of practice, um, you are going to be doing usually a lot of the same tasks that a paralegal can do. And the reason for that is several fold. Number one, law school, and this has changed somewhat since I was law school, but it hasn't changed perhaps as dramatically as some people think it should. Law school is not really much, as much geared toward practical skills as is a paralegal program. Paralegal program, we teach you how to make documents. We teach you some of the theory, some of the ideas behind it, but we're designed, but our program is designed to help you at the end of the day make the document. In law school, even though it's a lot longer, you spend a lot more time in theory, but you may never have actually drafted a complaint. You may have never actually drafted a divorce petition. You probably haven't, actually, but you know a lot of the theory about what needs to go into it and why that needs to go into it. But on your first day at work as an attorney, since you don't know what the form looks like, you're busy learning very mundane, boring, uh, 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 but practical things. And so those first few months, you are doing paralegal work. You may be able to spot some issues the paralegal wouldn't be able to spot, but you need to learn a little bit about almost getting on-the-job paralegal training to get yourself to the point of being able to be successful as an attorney. Now, I say paralegals can do most legal tasks. We're going to talk about the tasks that they can't perform in a few minutes. But whatever their tasks are, as long as they're legal tasks, it has to be under attorney supervision. This is really important. Paralegals cannot work independently of attorneys, at least not in the state of Texas, and I don't think it's in the other state where they can. So as long as the, the paralegal is, before a document leaves the law firm, is having an attorney review it, or before legal advice is given that the attorney has approved it, the paralegal can do a vast, vast number of tasks. But if the attorney, the paralegal doesn't have access to an attorney, she is really limited in what she can do. So this is a really important part of the equation. But again, there are a few things that she can't do. We say most, I would say virtually all. But there might be 5% of what an attorney can do that the paralegal can't do, even with attorney supervision, because that would cross the line as the unauthorized price of the law, which, of course, is a felony. So let's look at some tasks that paralegals can do ethically. One is she can interview clients and witnesses, and will routinely do so. He will investigate legal claims, be, um, uh, you know, lo looking up, trying to find witnesses, trying to get police reports, take pictures. Um, of scenes, confirm various um, claims that various witnesses are making. It's even possible occasionally for paralegals to appear at some closing and government hearings. Social Security disability hearings, for example, paralegals can represent claimants. There's a few immigration um, hearings where paralegals can represent claimants. Now these, I will tell you, are quite limited. Um, certainly most state matters, you would need to be a member of the State Bar Association. Most of the ones that do allow paralegals to have an active role are federal agencies, um, not courts, and there's just a handful of those. And in most cases, the reason why they allow paralegals is that the claimants in these cases rarely have the funds or the access for attorneys. And so the idea is, well, since these people are probably not going to be able to afford an attorney, it's better they have some help than no help. So these are fairly rare instances, and only if that particular agency permits it. But these can be some good avenues. Um, if you have an interest in this practice, think Social Security Disability or Immigration Matters. Finally, paralegals can draft legal documents. And the key word here is draft. Draft means to make a first or an early version of a document. So before it leaves the office, it has to be reviewed by an attorney. So that's the important takeaway, and again, that goes under that attorney supervision idea. For the rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about um, three ways of looking at, at uh, the material. One is looking at the NALA Code of Ethics. We're also going to look at the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. This is the uh, version of the NALA model, model rules that we have. And then we're going to look also at the Texas a uh, criminal statute is regarding the unauthorized practice of law. So let's get going. Okay, a little refresher about NALA. We talked about this earlier. This is what kind of our framing reference is going to be for the rest of the lecture. They're voluntary. No one has to follow the NALA rules, but they largely track what the state bar associations require. Of course, the state bar associations don't directly apply to the paralegals, but they do indirectly. NALA's Code of Ethics has 10 canons. The first five are paralegal-specific. 
the second five relate to all legal professions. So let's get started. Oh, well, let's talk about, sorry, I okay, I'll ahead of myself. Let's talk about the text of the disciplinary rules of professional conduct. Of course, this applies only directly to attorneys, but of course, every attorney is going to want everyone in his or her office to be following these rules. Um, because if somebody in the office makes a mistake, the attorney is going to be responsible. Even if the attorney didn't know about it, he or she has the responsibility to make sure there are no violations. And then let's look at the unauthorized practice law. This is that criminal statute. All states have an unauthorized practice of law statute. In Texas, the unauthorized practice of law can be a misdemeanor or a felony. Um, this is a rule, as I said before, that attorneys who are not licensed to practice in Texas but may be licensed to practice in several other states can still break this rule. If you practice law in Texas and you're not a member of the Texas Bar um, and you aren't practicing in federal court and a couple of other exceptions, which are kind of beyond the scope of this course, but if you're just you know, giving advice to the general public, and you're not a, a member of the Texas Bar, it doesn't matter that you're a member of 10 other state bar associations, you have committed a crime, the unauthorized practice of law. Now, one requirement for the unauthorized practice of law to be a crime is that the person um, who is engaged in this behavior has to have intended to benefit financially. So let's imagine that you are having dinner with your best friend. Your best friend says, hey, I think I'm, I'm going to need a divorce. Um, I know you're a paralegal. Can you tell me a little bit something about what I need to do? And, and I've got some paperwork. Can you look it over for me and tell me what I should do? Well, in that situation, you're not really seeking financial benefit. You're trying to help a buddy. And so you probably aren't engaging in an office practice of law as long as you don't seek financial benefit. Of course, if after or during that meal he says to you, Hey, I'll, I'll buy you dinner if you just help me out with this. Well, guess what? You've just now gotten the financial benefit. And so then, even though it's a modest financial benefit, then you potentially are guilty of an authorized practice of law. Now, let's look how this plays out if we're a paralegal. Imagine that we're at a paralegal. We earn $50,000 a year. We work in a law firm. And um, we uh, meet with clients from time to time. And a client comes to see, see you one day and goes, Hey, I know I'm having this problem with my ex-husband, and I don't know what to do. He's not he's behind on his child support, and um, you know I'm thinking about some strategies. And you want to help this person, and you first thing you say is when you talk to the attorney, he can give you some suggestions. And she says, Well, yeah, I can't afford. You know, the hourly rate for the attorney is so high, or he's so busy he won't have time for me. I surely you know what, what what the law firm does in these situations. Can't you just tell me? You see this all the time. And let's say for this one incident, you know, you, because this person you like and admire and you want to help, you say, okay, don't tell anybody, but here's a letter we use a lot in those types of cases. And, you know, you can fix it up and, and sign it, compare it for your own signature and send that to your, to your husband, and maybe that will help. And you may think, well, that's okay that I did that. I mean, I, yeah, I wrote firm policy, and it wasn't a best practice, but it's not the unauthorized practice of law because, after all, I didn't benefit financially. She didn't give me any money. Well, no. If you are earning wages, and especially if you're billing your time, because this person is going to pay for the time that you spend with this per with, with the paralegal. Let's say you bill at $125 an hour and you spend an hour with um, the client. Well, the client's going to pay $125. So the, the client is um, being paid for what you did. Now, you're not going to directly get that money. You get a flat salary. You don't get... Um, you know, a commission or a portion of the uh, billings that you, you generate. But, of course, the reason that you're being paid $50,000 a year is that you are generating the income for the law firm. So in that situation, when you're at your job as a paralegal, this is not an out for you because you are planning to benefit financially from this because that's your job. That's what you're paid for, to be a paralegal, but not to be an attorney. Another thing to keep in mind is the unauthorized practice of law is a very broad definition of what a practice of law is. Um, it's it's uh, not narrowly defined, and we'll look at the statute going forward in a little bit, but you can see it, it is uh, fraught with peril. So now we're going to go through things a, a paralegals must not do, the first uh, uh, canons of not law. The first one, canons one and two, here's one and here is two. First one is a paralegal must not perform any of the duties that attorneys only may perform, nor take any actions that attorneys may not take. So there's two aspects. If it's an attorney-only task, paralegals can't do it. 
And if attorneys are prohibited from doing it because of some ethical rule, paralegals can't do that either. So those are kind of two categories. Let's look at number two. A paralegal may perform any task which is properly delegated and supervised by an attorney as long as the attorney is ultimately responsible to the client, maintains a direct relationship with the client, and assumes professional responsibility for that work. So again, it goes back to the idea that the parallel can never be independent of the attorney. This is Canon 1 and Canon 2 of NALA. Let's look at what the Texas bar equivalent is. Um, the first is that the attorney has a duty to supervise the non-attorneys who work in the law firm. And so let's go through, actually before we do this, let's, let's uh, talk about some of those tasks that um, paralegals uh, can't do on their own. And the things that paralegals can't do, um, no matter whether they're being supervised or not, is the first thing is they can't appear in court. Now when I say appear in court, this has a very particular meaning. They can be in court, in fact they routinely are in court. In fact, in my experience, paralegals spend more time in court than attorneys do. Um, but they can't appear in court, appear in the record. They can't ask questions of witnesses. They can't make objections. They can't make arguments um, in court. They can be present. They can be taking notes. They can be passing notes to their attorney. They can be preparing witnesses. They can be all kinds of important things that in the courtroom that benefit the client, but they aren't going to be actually asking questions of witnesses. So that's one thing they can't do. They also can't sign documents as an sign legal documents. That's going to have something that the attorney does. And usually when we're talking about signing these documents, we're talking about signing a document that's filed in court. And in order to sign a document that gets filed in court, the attorney has to be um, admitted to practice in front of that court. So for example, I'm admitted to practice in any court in the state of Texas that is a state court. But if I want to practice law in federal court, I have to join the federal bar. And there's actually five federal bars, actually it's not five, but we'll say five for the sake of the story, five federal bars in Texas. We have the Southern District of Texas, the Eastern District of Texas, the Northern District of Texas, and the Western District of Texas. And then we have the Fifth Circuit, which is the appellate court that covers Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Now, I am admitted to practice in only three of the four district courts in the state of Texas. I am not admitted to practice in the Western District of Texas, and I'm not sure that my act, my membership is active in all of those other ones, because I haven't actually appeared in those courts in quite some time. And I've never been admitted to practice in the Fifth Circuit. So, you can see, in those jurisdictions, I can't sign legal documents, just like my grandmother, who has no legal training, can't sign the documents. You have to be admitted to practice in that court. I also can, as a paralegal, I cannot ask questions at a deposition. A deposition, I think we talked about when we were talking about discovery, that's one of those discovery tools, um, is designed, is a situation in which a court reporter takes down notes about or, or transcribes what is said at a deposition. One, one attorney asks, this is really hard to do. <laughs> okay, ask questions at a deposition. I'm going to abbreviate this because this is really not easy. Okay, um, so I can um, ask questions, or I, as, an, as an attorney, I can ask questions if I admit a question from the court, but I can't, as a non attorney, ask questions at a deposition of the witness um, because that counts as a court appearance. Even though depositions do not routinely happen in the court, they are something that can be admitted into evidence during the trial. Um, and then the final thing that a non-attorney cannot do is, this is probably the big one, one that's probably going to get you, is the most dangerous for you, because these, the first three are pretty easy to avoid, but this last one's a little bit hard. Can you have legal advice? So, these are things that a paralegal can't do, even if he or she is being well supervised by a licensed attorney. Some technical difficulties here. So I'm trying to write legal advice. 
Um, but, again, this is kind of a technical issue here, too. Well, let's go back to number two. I say that the paralegal cannot sign the legal document, but the paralegal may well have drafted the legal document. He or she may have written the whole thing, and the, the only thing the attorney may have done other than review it is to sign it. The attorney may not have made a single change. So the bulk of the work for that legal document may be the paralegal's work. Going to the deposition, the paralegal cannot ask questions on the record of the deposition, but she can prepare the witness for the deposition. He can take notes. He, the paralegal, can take notes during the deposition. She, the paralegal, can um, keep track of whether exhibits have gotten into the deposition and, and pass notes to the attorney recommending certain questions that the attorney should ask. Um, after the deposition is done, he can cover the uh, the answers to the deposition or the transcript of the deposition with the witness to see if there needs to be any kind of um, changes to the uh, the transcript. And the paralegal can also summarize the deposition. So there's lots of things relating to the deposition that the paralegal can do. Finally, I was talking about the legal advice. Actually, that should be a C. Sorry about that. Legal advice can, um, issue. Paralegal cannot give legal advice to an, uh, to a client. But again, this is less limiting than you might think. It's very common for a paralegal to develop legal advice. In fact, I would say paralegals probably, most paralegals do that probably every day. Um, the way that they do this, though, is that they develop the legal advice and they give it to the attorney. Then the attorney is in a position to evaluate it, to ask questions. Hey, did you look here? What about this case? Or what did that case say? Well, how about the statute? And then he's able to challenge or she's able to challenge and say, hey, paralegal, have you looked everywhere you need to? And the attorney now say, well, show me that case. Well, show me that statute. Well, show me that article where you got this information from. So to validate, say, yes, I agree with you or uh, no, I'm not sure that's where we come down on that point, or I think you need to look in some more places. And so because it's being vetted or um, uh, confirmed by the attorney before it's given to the client, that's good. That's fine. So it may be that the, the advice is coming out of the attorney's mouth, but it may be 99% of the paralegal's effort, and that's perfectly fine. The paralegal can give legal advice to the attorney. It's only the fact that the paralegal cannot give legal advice to the client without first having cleared it with the attorney. So let's imagine that you've prepared this, this legal advice, you've presented it to the attorney, the attorney says, yes, I think that's great. Go tell the client. You can do that. But the way you phrase it is not, this is my legal advice for you, um, but what you say is the attorney is advising you X, Y, Z, um, and you are, you, you are saying you know, the attorney has, has said this is the right thing for you to do. So you phrase it uh, as the attorney's advice because he's the one who's able to give legal advice in that situation. So let's look at some tasks. And the question is, are these attorney-only tasks? Can a paralegal do these tasks as well? If we were in class, I'd be going over these questions with you. We'd be voting to see what we think on these ones. But we're not going to do that here. Uh, can paralegal, is this an attorney-only task? Yes. In the vast majority of cases, a court is not going to allow a, a paralegal to appear in court, meaning talk in the record. Can a paralegal draft a will? Yes. So this is not an attorney-only function. The key word is draft. That's come up with the first edition or the first version of it um, that's shown to the attorney. The attorney may revise it. The attorney may say it's perfect, and then it's shown to the client. Can the paralegals uh, assign the uh, pleadings? Well, no. It's an attorney-only function. So so the, the Y is attorney-only. The, the, the N is paralegal can do it, too. Um, of course, the paralegal can prepare the plea. Can the paralegal depose a witness? Well, no, she can't. It's an attorney-only function. Can the paralegal interview a witness? Yes, she can. It's not, a paral not an attorney-only function. Can the paralegal conduct legal research? Well, let me pause here and talk about this one because this is kind of an interesting one. Conducting legal research is, by its very nature, the development of legal advice. You're looking at different sources and you're drawing conclusions from it. So absolutely, this has to do with legal advice. So you can't conduct legal research and then give it to the client without blessing it by the attorney. But again, when you conduct this legal research, you're going to be giving it to the attorney. And as I said before, there's no limitation upon giving legal advice to the attorney. So as long as you're conducting legal research and show that information to the attorney, that's perfectly fine. It's a common thing for paralegals to do. So no, that is not an attorney-only function. Oh, this is what I left off before. Let me flip back here and put one more item on this list. And that is, you, you need, a uh, parallel cannot establish an attorney-client relationship. And that makes sense, right? Because an attorney-client relationship 
involves an attorney and a client. And the paralegal is neither the attorney nor the client, so, you know, you, you, it makes sense that he or she cannot establish that relationship. Let me go to the next, back to the next slide. So this is an attorney-only function. But that doesn't mean that paralegals are not routinely involved in this. In fact, it's a pretty common first job for a paralegal to be what is called an intake paralegal. And this is common more so in plaintiff law firms than defense side law firms. But the way the job works is that you um, interview potential clients. And you'll have a checklist of questions, and you'll gather information, you'll review documents that the uh, potential clients come in with. And most most um, plaintiff's law firms work on a contingency fee basis. <coughs> so if someone comes in, let's say they're in a car accident case, and they want to sue the person uh, who ran into them. Um, they th These uh, cl potential clients usually don't have a lot of money. They're just ordinary people who had uh, this unfortunate situation arise. And so um, under those circumstances, um, they aren't able to pay an hourly fee that might be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars before it gets to trial. So the only thing they kind of have to offer is a contingency fee situation. What they, um, what usually the arrangement is between a plaintiff's law firm and their clients is that the plaintiff's law firm will take a percentage, maybe 25, maybe 30, maybe 40 percent of the recovery of the plaintiff. So when you're doing intake as an intake paralegal for plaintiff's law firms, what you're trying to see is really, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, two issues. First of all, um, is is the other person really to blame for the matter? Because obviously if, if your client is the one that made the mistake, well, guess what? You're not going to lose. You're not going to win the lawsuit. And if you don't win the lawsuit, then in a contingency basis situation, you're not going to, the law firm isn't going to collect anything. The law firm will have spent thousands of hours and get not any money out of it. It's not a good thing. The second thing is, even if the a plaintiff has a good case, uh, meaning that it's clear that the other guy was responsible for the accident. Actually, there's two things we're looking for. So the first thing is, who's responsible for the accident? Let's assume you decide it's not, the, not your potential client, somebody else. The second thing you're looking for is damages. If it was just a small fender bender with just a few thousand dollars worth of, of cosmetic damage to the person's car, at the end, the damages just aren't going to be there. Um, it doesn't make sense, even if you're sure you can win the case, to sue for $5,000. The law firm is going to get it returned from it because even 40% of $5,000 is, what, $2,000. You're going to breeze through that in one day of, of talking with the, with the witness. It's the way before you even get to trial. So there's just not enough damages to justify taking on that case for a plaintiff's law firm. The third thing you're looking for, you've established that the other guy is responsible for it, and you're going to be able to prove that. You know that your client has some significant damages, and of course you'll you'll be given a threshold. This is the the level of damages we expect before we're going to take on a client. But the third thing is the guy that you want to sue. How deep is his pocket? What kind of money does he have? Imagine for a second that the this potential client clearly was was wronged and was badly badly injured, lots and lots of medical bills, and his permanent injuries. The, the jury is going to be find very compelling. But guess what? The guy who ran into his car didn't have insurance, and he doesn't have any money. I mean, he, he earns $20,000 a year. You're not going to be able to get any kind of money out of him. In that situation, yes, you have a great lawsuit. Yes, if you file the lawsuit, you're going to, the jury's going to be persuaded to give your client, you know, thousands and maybe tens of thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. But if the person who you're suing doesn't have any money, well, there's no point in even going through that because you can't get blood out of a turnip. Now, um, of course, if a person has insurance or some other resources, then you might want to look at, at doing that. So a very common first job for paralegals to do the intake. And that, during that process, you, are, you, the intake paralegal, is not deciding, are not deciding whether you're going to take the place. You're asking questions, uh, developing the documentation um, to see if this is a good case. But you're probably given parameters. And after you do that intake interview and you review the documents, you're likely to make a recommendation based upon the parameters you're given. Say, hey, this looks like a case our law firm ought to take. Or, no, I think we should pass. Now, is it your final decision? No. It'll be taken to the attorney, and the attorney will make the final decision. But if you're doing your job well, according to the uh, parameters that you're given, probably 99 times out of 100, the attorney will say, yep, I agree with you. That's what we ought to do in this case. 
So while the paralegal doesn't make the final decision, he or she is very involved in that process in many cases. Let's look at the next one. Negotiate a fee arrangement. Okay, this is an attorney-only function. Um, only an attorney can, working with the, parent, with the uh, client, can decide what um, the fee structure ought to be. And the reason for that is that's fundamental to establishing the attorney-client relationship because it is an economic relationship. Almost all attorney-client relationships have some economic or some fee arrangement, and so that has to be negotiated by the attorney with the client. Having said that, most law firms don't actively negotiate with most clients. They have a set fee schedule, and, uh, and except if the client is, for, for whatever reason, going to give them lots of business or there's some other reason that this client is very appealing to the law firm, they're not going to make a special deal for that particular client. Under those circumstances, um, you, you, you as a paralegal will have the fee structure. You'll be able to communicate to the client. This is what we ordinarily do. So you may not be negotiating, but you certainly can talk to them about what the fee arrangement is likely to be. When I talked about giving legal advice, that's an attorney-only function, although the paralegal can give that legal advice to the attorney um, for the attorney's review, and if the attorney agrees, it can be given to the client. Paralegals, though, can investigate facts. Can investigate facts. Um, and the paralegals cannot recommend a settlement amount. This requires giving legal advice, so this is an attorney-only function. Because in order to give a settlement amount, you are essentially evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of the case. For example, let's say you, you want to recommend to your client that they accept the $25,000 settlement. Well, you must have some reasons for that. It may be that um, your client has some good facts, which point to high levels of liability, but there's a chance that the jury might not be persuaded that it was the other guy's fault. And so you're evaluating the legal standard, how the jury will respond to it, in order you're giving legal advice when you're doing that. And only an attorney can do that. Having said that, paralegals routinely develop recommendations for settlement amounts. They might search through example jury findings in that jurisdiction, um, look at the various legal issues that are in play, make a recommendation to the attorney, the attorney review it, and then uh, forward that to the um, the uh, client for approval. And yes, a paralegal can correspond with opposing counsel. I don't think that's that common. Most of the time, the attorney is going to want to sign a letter that sends to the opposing counsel because the opposing counsel kind of expects to hear from the attorney. But there's nothing unethical about a paralegal uh, signing a correspondence to opposing counsel. What is important is a paralegal do, do, does that on the letterhead of the law firm that the paralegal identify himself or herself as a paralegal so that that person cannot be confused for, with an attorney. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm going to pick up the speed a little bit here. Um, this is Canon 3 of the Nala Rules. A paralegal must not engage in, encourage, or, or contribute to any act which could constitute the unauthorized practice of the law. A paralegal must not establish an attorney-client relationship. We already talked about that. Set fees, give legal opinions, or represent a client before a court unless authorized to do so by a court or agency. Also, a paralegal must not engage in any conduct or take any action which would assist or involve the attorney in a violation of professional ethics or give the appearance of professional impropriety. This is kind of repeated what we've already said. Let's look at canon number four. A paralegal must use discretion and professional judgment commensurate with experience and knowledge, but must not render independent legal judgment in place of an attorney. So she has to be working with the attorney. Um, she can give legal judgment to the attorney, but she can't give it independently of the attorney's um, ad advice. The services of an attorney are essential in the public interest whenever such legal judgment is required. This is the equivalent Texas Rules of Professional Conduct, Dis Texas Discipline Rules of Professional Conduct. An attorney shall not practice law in a jurisdiction where doing so violates the regulation of the legal profession in that jurisdiction. What is that? The unauthorized practice of law, right? A lawyer shall not assist a person who is not a member of the bar in performance of an activity that constitutes the unauthorized practice of law. So the attorney can't help the paralegal engage in un unethical behavior in the unauthorized practice of law. So let's look at what the unauthorized practice of law is. We kind of touched on it before. You look to the statutes to see what it is in a particular state, but there's also going to be court opinions. You're going to define it in more detail. But these are generally what the standards are, and this is more of a, a national look. We'll look at the Texas-specific information in just a second. Um, 
Of course, we talked about they can't establish uh, one activity that only an attorney can do is establishing the attorney-client relationship. Another activity is setting legal fees. A third is giving legal advice. A fourth is representing a client uh, before a court without authorization from that court or engaging in or contributing in some way to an unauthorized practice of law. So very similar to what we've already talked about. Let's talk about some related topics that might not immediately seem connected. The first is prohibition against fee splitting. I said before in my example that the paralegal in my story was earning $50,000 a year. She was billing her time. Let's say she billed 2,000 hours a year. Um, in each one of those hours, a client was charged $125. Well, you might think to yourself, you know what, it might be smart for that law firm to give the paralegal some percentage of that money on top of her paycheck because that would motivate her to work more hours, which would result in the law firm getting more money. So maybe the law firm could say, well, we're going to pay you $40,000, but we're going to give you 20% or 10% or whatever percent of the amount of money that you generate for the law firm. Well, that is legally not okay. It violates the professional obligation because there can be no fee splitting. Attorneys cannot share fees with non-attorneys. And the reason for that is even though the paralegal should wisely follow the bar rules that the attorney has to follow, technically the bar association cannot sanction the paralegal. And so if the attorney and the paralegal are fee splitting and the paralegal is gaining money because of the practice of law and she is not uh, limited in the type of behavior that she can do, you could see how she might start engaging in unethical behavior that might cause the business to be more financially successful and she's experiencing some benefit from that. But now the attorney is also experiencing a benefit from that. So that's why fee splitting is absolutely prohibited. That doesn't mean that paralegals don't routinely get bonuses. They can get bonuses. What the bonuses can't be is the bonuses can't be related to the profitability of the law firm, at least in a direct way. Now, very often what a law firm will do is let's say they've had a great year. They've had maybe a couple of big jury verdicts or they've had a very high billable rate in a particular year. They may give everyone in the office, attorneys and paralegals, all a bonus. But it, this was not something that the law firm was contractually required to do. This is just a, a gratis, a gift, a thank you. Under those situations, there is no contract. So this is not a fee-splitting situation. It would only be a contract if the law firm were required to split fees under those circumstances. We've already talked about not giving legal advice or representing clients in court, so let's keep on going. It's fairly important that the paralegal disclose his or her paralegal status in all written correspondence. In all oral communication, obviously, you don't, if you are talking regularly with somebody every day, you don't have to say, oh, by the way, I'm still a paralegal, just like I was yesterday, and I'm going to be a paralegal tomorrow. Um, so, I mean, obviously, common sense kicks in, but when you uh, are talking to new clients and people that you, um, opposing counsel, of course, you need to communicate because the assumption people will make is that you're an attorney working in the law firm. And especially with clients, it's probably a good idea to say it more than once, especially if they're relatively unsophisticated because they may not really understand what the distinction between paralegal and attorney is. And keep in mind that when the average person deals with a law firm, they're kind of intimidated and confused, and they usually have something pretty emotional going on in their life in order to motivate them to make this visit anyway. So probably their ears aren't maybe as focused on hearing all the details as it would under other circumstances. Some um, paralegals do work as freelance or independent paralegals. Um, freelance paralegals are usually not engaged in an unfair, excuse me, an un, unauthorized practice of law situation because they're going to be adequately supervised. And let me explain how that happens. Imagine that I uh, set up my uh, freelance paralegal business, but I don't market myself to the general public. I market myself to a law firm from town, maybe to the smaller law firm from town. And I say to them, look, when one of your paralegals is on maternity leave or a paralegal uh, quits all of a sudden and you don't have someone to fill in, call me and I'll either work from home or come into your office for a few weeks or for a few months. Call me when you suddenly have more work that you know what to do with, but you're not ready to hire another paralegal. I will fill in. But in all those cases, that freelance paralegal is going to be supervised the exact same way as a paralegal who is regularly employed in law firm. All of the work is going to be vetted by the attorney. So as you'll hear, people call legal technicians. Um, and these are people who provide services directly to the public. 
I highly, highly discourage you from doing it. It's almost possible, almost impossible to do without engaging in a large price of law in Texas. In fact, I would say it probably is impossible to do. And you definitely don't want to get yourself into that situation. If you want to practice law, you ought to go to law school. Let's look at a couple of things here. Um, just wanted to touch base on these. Um, actually, let's look at this bottom one here. We have paralegal Jamal. His attorney has given him explicit and detailed guidance on how to prepare non-contested divorce papers. The attorney is on vacation, and the client insists on filing right now. And let me tell you, I'm going to try this. Clients are crazy. They all are crazy. They seem rational sometimes, but trust me, I'm making a huge generalization, but uh, you will find that normal, nice, lovely people during the year that they are undergoing some kind of legal crisis are oftentimes very, very difficult. They may be wonderful for the other 99 years of their life, but this year they are difficult, they are demanding, they are unreasonable. And that's what Jamal is facing here, a client who's unwilling to wait a few more days until the attorney gets back. So Jamal's trying to figure out how do I keep this client happy under these circumstances. And so he decides, or he's thinking, well, I have these detailed instructions. Surely I can follow them exactly and have the attorney sign the divorce petition and we're good to go. Um, but Jamal can't do that. I understand and, and commend him for his customer service focus, but the reality is even though the attorney has given detailed instructions, the attorney hasn't given detailed instructions with respect to this client. And there may be particular issues with this client that require special circumstances or special treatment. And Jamal doesn't know what to look for to identify those special issues. That's not his job. That's the attorney's job to do. And so Jamal can't do that. There may be another attorney in the office who Jamal can go to. It doesn't have to be the normal attorney. It could be any licensed attorney. And that attorney can look it over probably 99 times out of 100. And they'll say, Jamal, this looks great. You can go ahead and file it. Um, or it could be that Jamal needs to um, send the document to the attorney on his vacation. Unfortunately, it's not too nice for the attorney, but sometimes you have to do that. But Jamal cannot, and, and neither could any paralegal, um, file the document unless he or she has gotten explicit approval from the attorney for doing so. And this is the Texas statute that an author's practice for. I'm not going to really spend any time on it. I just wanted to show it to you. And it's posted just for FYI purposes. Now we're going to go through things that a paralegal must do. We're up on to um, canon number five. A paralegal must disclose his or her status as a legal assistant. And just a pause here. Legal assistant means exactly the same thing as paralegal. In certain parts of the country, legal assistant can have a bit broader meaning than paralegal. Um, I've heard in some parts of the country, legal assistant um, is interpreted to include um, other legal workers, such as legal secretaries. In Texas, though, at least within my experience, most legal professionals um, interpret the term legal assistant to mean exactly the same thing that paralegal means. So as you're looking for jobs or you're um, seeing position descriptions, don't assume that these terms mean anything different. Before I came to become a faculty member here at Collin College, I actually thought that the term legal assistant was preferred by paralegals um, than the term paralegal. And I actually, before I came here, I asked several of my very close paralegal friends, hey, which, which do you prefer? With that exception, they all said, I don't care. Either term's fine with me. And about half preferred legal assistant, half preferred paralegal. So you'll find out in this market that there's really no uh, preference for one term over the other. But other parts of the country, you might find some difference. Anyway, that's just a side discussion. So let's go back to the uh, Canon 5 here. A paralegal must disclose his or her status as a legal assistant at the outset of any professional relationship with a client, attorney, or um, court or administrative agency, or personnel thereof, or a member of the general public. A paralegal must act prudently in determining the extent to which a, para a client must be maybe a system without the presence of an attorney. So we have this duty to let the world know I'm not an attorney. I am a legal assistant. I am not licensed to practice law. So let's look at some examples to see if these paralegals provided enough of a uh, uh, information to the public. Paralegal gives his business card to a potential client. The card states, John Smith, CLA Legal Professional. CLA, by the way, is a, a certification that you can get from NALA. It means Certified Legal Assistant. Very prestigious, very, very difficult to get. It's one of the things that we prepare you for taking. We prepare you for taking this test. Um, 
our final course in the program, LGLA 2339, is prepped for that test. And we hope that you will take it, and we have confidence that you'll be successful if you choose to take it. Anyway, it's very prestigious, very good that John has this credential, and very smart of him to put it on his business card. The problem is that people outside the legal profession don't know what CLA means. And so they see that in the terms legal like professional, and the average one is going to think, oh, John's an attorney, um, because they don't, they don't know what the, what the terminology means. So this is not effective. The next one is paralegal introduced herself as Gwen, Bob Smith's right arm, and Bob is the attorney. Again, this is vague um, and also kind of demeaning to, to Gwen. I wouldn't recommend Gwen talk about herself in that way, because it's possible that Bob Smith's right arm well, presumably it's attached to his right shoulder, but even if it's not, it uh, could be an attorney. Now, many times uh, a junior attorney is kind of called the briefcase holder for the more senior attorney. The junior attorney may kind of follow the more senior attorney around, uh, carrying the, the books and carrying the papers to court and other places. And so that person might be the right arm. So certainly Gwen has not told the world that she's a paralegal. All she said is that she has a kind of a subordinate or helping role to Bob, the attorney. Next one is paralegal. Paralegal signs a letter, Doug Chen, paralegal to Bob Smith. Okay, this is great. It, it, he, Doug is not required to add the to Bob Smith, but it's fine to. The important word here is the term paralegal. And, of course, uh, Doug Chen could have used legal assistant instead. Paralegal calls opposing counsel and states, this is Pat Green from the office of Brown and Juarez. Okay, this doesn't work. She's using the name of a law firm, and she's not saying uh, that she's a paralegal. Now, of course, she doesn't have to say in the first sentence. Her next sentence could be, I'm a paralegal in that office, and then, of course, she's covered her basis. So if this is all that she says to explain who she is, this is inadequate. So let's keep on going. Let's go to um, canon number six. A paralegal must strive to maintain integrity and high level of competency through education and training with respect to professional responsibility, local rules, and practice, and through continuing education in substantive areas of law to better assist the legal profession in fulfilling its duties, duty to provide legal service. And the same duty um, exists for attorneys. Attorneys are required to take continuing legal education courses, that's uh, 15 hours a year. And this is the same requirement under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. An attorney has to provide competent and diligent representation. And if they can't, they can't provide that representation. And this is, again, more information. I'm not going to talk in more detail about this one, but this kind of talks about um, um, when an attorney has to abide by the client's decision and when the attorney can uh, not abide by that decision. An attorney is required to keep regular communication open with the client, and it's very common for the paralegal to take on that role. Just because an attorney has to communicate regularly with the client doesn't mean the attorney himself or herself has to actually communicate with the client. The attorney can delegate that role to the paralegal, but of course the, the attorney has to monitor it and, and make sure that those conversations are actually happening. We're up to canon number seven. A paralegal must protect the confidences of a client and must not violate any rule or, or statute now in effect or hereafter enacted controlling the, the uh, conduct, the, the, the doctrine of privileged communications between a client and an attorney. So you have to keep the secrets of, of your client. Um, uh, if the, if it's an attorney client privilege matter, obviously it has to be done. But even if it's something else, the, the client is coming to you and the client is paying for the services and so therefore you should keep the secrets. Now there are some times where you can't keep secrets. For example, if your client comes into your office and says, I want to kill my husband, I want you to tell me how I can get away with it. I've already bought the gun, I have the bullets, I'm, as soon as I'm leaving here I'm going to go to his uh, place of business and shoot him in the head. In those situations you don't keep that confidence. You uh, make sure you're safe because this is a pretty crazy person. Um, and then you immediately call the police so that the police can protect the, the health of the husband. The attorney client privilege is not more important than preservation of life. But outside those extreme circumstances, you do have to keep the confidences of the client. And this is the Texas Rule of Disciplinary Procedure that talks about that same idea. And more of that. And more of that. And more of that. Okay, so let's look about um, some issues about confidential information. Um, some the the privilege, the attorney-client privilege, belongs to the client. It is the client's possession. 
Um, but the client can't absolutely control it. Imagine for a second that um, the client has shared confidence. Let's say that the client is seeking a divorce, and he comes to, um, we'll say his name is Bob, and Bob comes to the attorney, and you're in the meeting as well, and Bob says, and uh, Bob the client says, um, I want to get a divorce from my wife. I have found someone new, and I'm having an affair with that person, so I want to divorce my current wife. I would like to eventually marry um, this, this new person that I am seeing. But I don't want my first wife to know about the new person because I don't think she will take that news well, and I think that she might make the, the divorce more difficult and might uh, make uh, my relationship with our children more difficult, so I want you to keep that a secret. Um, and so... Um, the, the attorney leaves, I mean, the, the client leaves that meeting, and you go off to lunch with friends, and you're talking, oh, gosh, I mean, we have this new client, and he's having an affair. It's just terrible. And you drop some information, and the, the people in the next um, uh, in the next booth at Applebee's overhears that, and they happen to know Bob. And they can tell from what you're saying that you're talking about Bob the client. And so then one of them is actually best friends with Bob's wife. So that person calls up Bob's wife and says, hey, Sally, you'll never believe this. I was in the Applebee's, and I heard some people, they appear to be legal professionals, talking about your husband. And it seems like your husband's about to file a divorce petition against you, and guess what? He's cheating on you on top of that. And so you can see how, even though the privilege belongs to Bob, you have waived it. You have, it, probably inadvertently, you probably didn't want that to happen, but by being indiscreet, by having a conversation that can be overheard, that information has gotten out. And, of course, you can't unring that bell. Um, the client, the, the, the wife is never going to forget that she knows this information. So you have to be so, so careful. It's best not to have conversations at all in public about those matters. But you also have to protect other things like cell phones. Cell phones can be intercepted. The, the signal can be intercepted. And if you leave a document somewhere, that can be viewed by others, or even just having your computer screen up, maybe on a plane or waiting somewhere. If it's in an angle other people can see it, you are potentially revealing that confidential information. So you have to be very, very cautious. Also, email messages and uh, text messages and things like that. Um, so, what is the scope of the attorney-client privilege? Well, it's usually a bit when when the when there are conversations regarding the the client's legal rights and the client's legal problems, those are generally going to be privileged to some extent at least. Um, and that information is, is usually not going to be shareable. Um, the, the facts of the situation, for example, um, as that, let, let's assume that you hadn't let the cat out of the bag about Bob's affair. And let's say Bob has filed a divorce petition, his wife Sally has been served, and you're now in the discovery process. And one of the questions Sally's attorney in the discovery is, has Bob been unfaithful during the course of his marriage to Sally? And let's say Bob isn't maybe a stand-up guy. It doesn't seem like he probably is under this scenario. And so he says, well, I don't think there's any way Sally knows about my affair, and so let's just lie. Let's just go ahead and say, oh, yes, I've been faithful. Well, guess what? Y'all can't because, number one, that would be contributing to perjury because these documents are sworn documents. So while you can't reveal Bob's confidence to you, you also can't let him lie. Um, now, if he, had, if he had lied to you or never had answered those questions before, then you could take him at his word. But now that you know what he's saying is incorrect, um, you have to either persuade him to tell the truth, admit to the affair, or you have to find some objection to the question and not answer it at all, which probably isn't going to work. Or you may have to withdraw as, a, as his attorney because you cannot ethically um, represent somebody who wants to perjure himself. If you breach the duty of confidentiality, going back to that Applebee's restaurant, not only is the information that the people in the next booth hear, not only does that weigh the privilege with respect to that, but it's possible if the breach of confidentiality is sufficiently severe, the whole privilege might be waived. It might be such that because you, you said enough about the information, everything that Bob has told you may have to be revealed. So you may, for example, because Sally hears about Bob is having an affair, and then maybe Sally's attorney subpoenas you um, to to provide testimony, and you are asked, well, who did Bob say he was having the affair with? And you might say, well, I'm not supposed to give that information up, but the judge might well rule, well, no, you, you let out the bag over so much of the stuff, you can't now claim you're not supposed to talk. And so it can even be a worse penalty than 
uh, simply giving up the bit of information that you did. Let's look at Canon 8. A paralegal must disclose to his or her employer or prospective employer any existing pre-existing clients or personal relationships that may conflict with the interests of the employer or prospective employer and or its clients. Um, this is what's oftentimes called a conflicts check. Um, when you go to work for a new place, you're very likely to be asked to list your major clients, and that's put into the database. And it may turn out that you have some conflicts. There may be some people who um, represent um, some of your former clients who have an adverse position to some of the clients in the law firm. So it may be such that you can't work on certain matters and because of that conflict. Um, and so you have to bring those to the attention so you don't inadvertently start working on those matters. Uh, let's talk briefly about the idea of conflicts of interest, and these are the Texas rules of dis Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct. These are the numbers for those. You don't need to know those numbers, but I'm providing them for you for FYI purposes. Okay, so an attorney should not represent a client if it would be adverse to another client's interest. So if one client um, has one particular interest, he's already an existing client, you can't take on another client whose position um, is, is such that it's going to hurt the position of the first client. Uh, parties may consent to simultaneous representation if there are no adverse effects. A very common situation for simultaneous representation is a, two spouses, a husband and a wife. Uh, maybe they have some claim against the person who built their house. And naturally, they don't want to hire separate attorneys. That would be an unreasonable expense. So they hire one attorney to represent both of them. And in that situation, it's very, very common, perfectly acceptable to do. It does raise some issues because it may be that one of the parties has a better claim against the home builder than the other. Um, so there's a danger that there could be some conflict of interest, but most of the time it's perfectly okay to proceed in that way. An attorney should not represent an adversary to a former client in a related matter. Um, a job change may require the creation of an ethical law. That's that situation wherein um, I had some conflict of interest and so I can't work on that matter anymore. I can't even hear about that matter anymore. That's the idea of an ethical law. There's like this movable law, metaphorical law, that surrounds me that I can't participate in any way in that matter. And as I said before, conflicts check are the standard procedure and helps to avoid these conflicts from developing. It's a proactive way of avoiding a problem. And here is the conflict of interest general rule in Texas. I'm not going to go over that one, just kind of FII purpose. And we're up to, I think, our final section here, which is about the last three canons, the, the last part of canon number three, and canon number nine, and then canon ten. So last part of three says a paralegal um, cannot engage in any conduct or take any action which would assist or involve the attorney in violation of professional ethics or give the appearance of professional impropriety. A paralegal, so it's must not. So I'll just add the word not here. A paralegal must do all other things incidental, necessary, or expedient for the attainment of the ethics and responsibilities as defined by statute or rule of court. A paralegal's conduct is guided by our association codes of professional responsibility and rules of professional conduct. In other words, the bottom line is the paralegal has to follow the same rules the attorney does. Here are a couple of other rules that um, um, are very important for paralegals and attorneys to know. And they aren't always the most intuitive. The first one is about fees. Uh, we talked before about how uh, the law is a profession. There are barriers to entry and the attorneys have to follow the ethical rules. And one of those ethical rules will relate to fees. Fees have to be reasonable. Now, almost every client of a law firm thinks to themselves, yeah, really? The fees I pay seem completely unreasonable. And they certainly are high for, for most people to have to pay for. And fees are a relative matter. You have to look at the skill and time required what the market in that community has. And that there's actually a, an attorney in the Valsal with area who charges $1,000 an hour. That's very unusual. But it's very common for attorneys to be charging four, five, six hundred dollars That's not at all uncommon. And in fact, paralegals routinely charge anywhere from, say, $75 an hour up to $200 an hour. So even paralegals can charge a very significant amount of money. 
And of course, this all turns upon the skill. If you had an attorney straight from law school, hasn't had any big cases, um, isn't in an expensive market, and he wanted to charge a thousand dollars an hour, well, for one, he's not going to get any business. But if he somehow finagled somebody into giving you business, he would be violation, violating this professional ethical rule because his fees are not re reasonable given his skill set and given the market in which he practices in. And the other rule I want to talk about is when you are representing an organization. Now, this doesn't apply if you're a divorce attorney or a criminal defense attorney. Um, but let's say you represent a corporation, maybe a corporation that's being sued. Um, imagine that um, uh, uh, you are representing Walmart in, against a person who is suing it because that person went to the Walmart store, slipped and fell, and had an accident. And they're now suing Walmart. And so you are representing Walmart. And, of course, when you actually interact with the client, you're not interacting with the corporation Walmart. You're interacting with a flesh and blood human being. It may be someone from the law department. It may be the store manager. It may be a lower level manager. Um, let's assume for a second that it is the store manager. Um, and um, this is the face of Walmart to you. This is the person you've been told that you need to deal with. This is the expert in the procedures that are, are relevant to this particular matter. And so you get to know him. You probably develop some kind of relationship, maybe some rapport with him. And you start thinking about this guy as your client. That's a very natural thing. But guess what? He's not your client. Your client is Walmart, the corporation. And so let's say that store manager reveals to you in the process of your representation of Walmart that he has done something that violates Walmart policies. And you, and you might say, to you, you know what, you're my attorney. I don't want to tell you. I've, I've been bending some rules. I've been doing some accounting things wrong. I know I can tell this to you, though, and you're going to help me out. Well, no, you can't help him out because your first job is to tell what you've learned to your client, to the, guy, to the entity that's paying your bills. And so you'd have to report whatever it is that you hear and let Walmart decide what to do with that information. So you always have to make that distinction. Is my client the entity, the corporation, the partnership, the company, or is it a human being? If it's a human being, it's usually a pretty straightforward matter. But if it's the entity, you're going to be dealing with human beings, and you shouldn't confuse those people with your client, even though you're probably going to call them your client. They really aren't. Another thing to think about is truthfulness. You have to be truthful to others when you are dealing as um, a lawyer or as a paralegal. In the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person or fail to disclose the material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid making the attorney a party to a criminal act or knowingly assisting a fraudulent act perpetrated by a client. Now, many people like to joke and talk about lawyers being dishonest, and, and certainly there are examples of attorneys who have behaved ethically in a very poor way. I don't want to defend all attorneys by any means. But most attorneys take these rules very, very seriously. And they consider it a privilege to have a law license, and they treat it with a great deal of respect. And hopefully those will be the type of people that you work with in your career. So let's look at some bottom lines. What are the bottom lines that, uh, things that you ought to think about as you think of how these rules might apply to you. Well, first of all, watch out for the unauthorized practice of law. The big thing here is have things checked by the attorney. Keep secrets. Don't worry about whether it's attorney-client privilege or not. Just keep it a secret. And make sure that you're handling your emails and your cell phones and your conversations in a very appropriate and confidential manner. Over-disclose your status as a paralegal. If you think there's any doubt in somebody's mind about who you are, Tell them. Disclose any potential conflicts that you may have. Even if it seems silly and minor, better to reveal it than not to. Continue to gain expertise in your practice. Learn, grow, attend continuing education. And the bottom line is behave as if the bar rules apply to you. They don't directly, but they might as well. Here's a summary. Attorneys are regulated directly to their state bar's licensing requirements and ethical rules. Ethical rules governing attorneys affect paralegals, the duty of confidence, the duty to supervise, the need to be co uh, maintain confidentiality, the attorney-client privilege, and conflict of interest rules. Paralegals are regulated indirectly. They have to follow the attorney ethical rules. They should follow the NALA and the NFPA ethical codes. 
and they ought to look to the ABA and the state guidelines regarding how paralegals are appropriately used in a law firm. State laws prohibit non-attorneys from engaging in the practice of law with criminal sanctions. And it's an open discussion these days about whether paralegals should be licensed um, and, and what a license should mean under those circumstances. We really don't have a resolution on that issue yet. If you have questions about this topic, please feel free to um, email me your questions. If I think they are ones of general interest, I will be delighted to cover them um, in, a, in something that I send to the whole class, or I will answer your questions um, separately. Thank you for your attention. And now I'm going to open up my desktop for a couple of minutes, and I don't have a lot more to do. I want to show you the documents. This is, let me go back to, let's go to learning modules. We're on learning module 14. In this uh, presentation, we've covered the first two PowerPoints. Now we're going to look at the um, Paralegal Ethics blog. It's right here. This talks about um, ethical walls. Uh, you're responsible for having read this for the purposes of the final examination. And then we have here, this is, I guess those are the only two things we have. So um, uh, here is, oh, actually, I have here the Dis Texas Disciplinary Rules Professional Conduct. This was one of the links that um, was in the PowerPoint presentation. I don't expect you to read this. As you can see, it's 123 pages, so it's a very lengthy document, and none of it is light reading, but I wanted to make you aware of it. You can find it at texasbar.com. So with that in mind, I'm going to close our presentation. Thank you for your attention. Again, if you have questions, come by my office hours or send me an email. I'll be delighted to work with you on an answer to whatever you might have. And I am going to close this session down.